Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York, and our virtual worship series. This video is for Sunday, May 16th, 2021, which is the seventh Sunday after Easter. We're glad you're tuning in this morning, and we thank you for joining us, and um, we pray that you're having a safe and healthy week this week. Our prayers are with all of you who are still at risk, and all of you who are dealing with family members and loved ones, or yourselves, um, dealing with COVID-19. So... We're praying for you all. We're glad you're here right now. So let's frame our hearts and minds before God as we prepare to worship. <clears throat> and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own. And by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So the first reading for this morning is from Acts chapter 1, beginning at the 15th verse. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 people and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justus, and Matthias. They prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the Gospel for this morning is from John chapter 17, beginning at the sixth verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So in today's gospel, Jesus is, um, we're back on Holy Week again. Jesus is at the table after the Last Supper, and he knows that soon everything is going to change. 
<clears throat> and on this last night that he is with his disciples, um, one of the central themes of his prayer for them is that they will be one. Which seems like a pretty tall order, considering that in just a few hours, the disciples are going to be anything but one. I mean, Judas is already on the way to the high priest's house. Peter, James, and John are about to fall asleep during Jesus' greatest time of need in the garden. Peter will deny Christ three times, and all of them are going to run away overnight into the next day. How are they ever going to be one? How will we ever be one? I mean, is Jesus' prayer just hopeless optimism? Is this the one prayer that Jesus preaches that doesn't get answered? I mean, and looking at the world lately, is this whole unity theme a complete waste of time? Well, take heart. There's still hope. I mean, take a look at who's sitting around that Last Supper dinner table. This is a motley crew of disciples who are individuals coming from all walks of life, from all political parties, who found themselves assigned to one another, not by choice, but by Jesus. And they find themselves set out together on the same team. And sure, they struggle. That's kind of the main point of their part of the equation of the Gospels is that what we read over and over again is their struggle to be one, their struggle to be faithful, their struggle against their own humanity and their own egos. That's part of the point of all these things that we read. But here on this night, Jesus is reminding them once again that there is something larger at work here. There is a greater purpose that Judas didn't understand and that the 11 still don't understand. There is something more important at stake here than their own individual opinions. There's something more pressing here than their own individual fears. There's something going on that's more demanding than their own desires. And especially with what happened to Judas just a few minutes ago at the table, we all know what happened. You know, we can see that the larger purpose isn't always clear. Why was it so easy for Judas to lose his focus? You know, it's easy for us too. Maybe it's especially easy for us to lose focus because in our world, the consequences of spiritual lack of focus don't seem to be as pressing or immediate, you know, in our discipleship as they were even for Judas. So in our world, especially, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the little things. It's so easy to split hairs and be divided. And Jesus knew that we were going, all going to have like a really hard time figuring all this out. And that's why he's praying over them at the table on this night before his crucifixion. He wants them to be one. Even more importantly, he wants them to be protected from the evil one, the dividing one. And Jesus wanted these 11 at the table to understand if nothing else, this one fundamental thing, that he was Jesus the Christ, their Lord and Savior, sent by God. He was the greater purpose. And obviously this prayer didn't sink in on this night, and it took the disciples another 50 days after, you know, the resur after the crucifixion and the resurrection conversation to even begin to figure all this out. I mean, that's what Pentecost is all about. But we, we have an advantage. We know the end of the story. We can flip ahead, you know? So look, we ought to know that we don't always have to agree on everything. We ought to know that we don't always have to have the answers. We ought to know from what Judas did and what all the disciples did right after this conversation happened. We ought to know that, that we don't necessarily have all the tools and we can't always be 100% perfect and faithful. But you know what? Working in harmony, you know, it's a great way to be one. Because just like in music, harmony creates depth. Contrasting ideas 
contrasting gifts can be brought together into a common purpose. The disciples didn't all have to think alike, but neither do we. They didn't have to all do the exact same thing. They even had opposite ideas at times. But Jesus didn't seem to care about that. You know, we don't have to be cookie cutter people. We don't have to be exactly the same. Harmony and unity still resonate as one. If our energy is spent toward the larger purpose, which is Christ. You know, if we are one that is all centered on the cross, right? Then in unity and harmony, we can gather together and get things done through prayer. You may remember what happened on the, the day of the transfiguration, right? And the disciples couldn't heal this little girl who was, who was ill. And, and Jesus was frustrated with them and said, you know why you can't heal her? Because that has to be done through prayer. Because it's not about you. It's about God. So... And speaking of prayer, uh, I read you the first lesson this morning because it was interesting. You know, look at the way that the disciples gathered together in, in Acts to try to choose the new 12th disciple to replace Judas. You know, and it's, it's funny because casting lots to elect somebody doesn't exactly sound like prayer. It sounds more like flipping coin or, or rolling the dice to determine someone's fate. It doesn't seem to make sense to place God's will on the same plane as pure luck. <laughs> but here's the point. Don't worry. It's, there's a point to this. Casting of lots shows us that the disciples were willing to take themselves out of the decision-making process. They gave it fully and completely to God in prayer. Most of that text in Acts is the prayer they gave because they wanted God to be in control of the process, and they let God be in control of the process. You know, and I'm, I'm honestly constantly surprised in my own life to see how many times God's decisions have become clear in ways that we can't predict or ways that we can't control, that God's decisions and call and will for us has become clear in ways that almost look like chance or like coincidence until you start looking backwards and add them all up together, and then you start to see where God was acting. You know, but the more we try to control the process, the harder it is for God to work, frankly. <laughs> when you really lift something up to God in prayer, sometimes you'll see things that you wouldn't have seen or couldn't have seen had you not opened your mind and your heart to God in that moment. And that is what the disciples were doing by casting lots after they prayed. So, can we take ourselves out of it? Can we take ourselves out of the equation long enough to discern God's voice and work in our midst? Can we take ourselves out of it long enough to discern the larger purpose to which we have all been called? Can we take ourselves out of it long enough to believe and to trust that the Holy Spirit can and does work in our lives and in the lives of our neighbors? Well, we're going to try in just a few minutes. Well, you're not going to try because I'm just taping with you. But in live church, we're going to try to figure that out in just a few minutes because we're having a baptism. And when the parents bring their little daughter up to the front of the church. We are all giving her up to God. In that moment of baptism, we're all taking ourselves out of the equation and asking God to take charge of her life, her forgiven life, her eternal life. And together as a congregation, we're all going to promise to keep doing that for the rest of her life. And we will bond together in that sacramental moment as a community of faith. Well, more as a family of faith. To put all of our differences aside and feed this little child of God and ourselves with the one true bread of life. And why will we do that? <laughs> because we are one. We are one in reconciliation. We are one in restoration. We are one in forgiveness. We are one in the cross. 
In today's second lesson, the first letter of John, we heard, whoever has the Son has life. That means you, all of us. So after this baptism, you know, they're going to come up to the communion table. You know, after this moment, think about what all this means and then give it all up to God in prayer right now in your home. Give yourself up to God in prayer. And you know what? Though you are many, you will all be one. In the name of the Father and the One and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, the One, be with you always. Take a moment to share the peace with everybody in the room. Um, make a call, send a text, let somebody know that the Holy Spirit is active and working in their life as well. And now gathered into one by that one Holy Spirit, let us pray boldly as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And remember, you are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Go in peace. Be one. Serve the Lord in love. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being with us this week, and we hope to see you either in person or on video next week. God bless you all.